Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 144, Dr. Timothy Paul's In Defense of Conciliar Christology, Part 2. Dr. Timothy Paul is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. He earned his Ph.D. at the University of St. Louis in 2008, and his areas of specialization include analytic metaphysics, Thomistic philosophy, philosophy of religion, and analytic theology. He's published about two dozen articles on topics such as free will, truthmaker theory, divine immutability, atheism, transubstantiation, and theories about incarnation. He's here with us again today to talk about his 2016 book, In Defense of Conciliar Christology, a philosophical essay. In this second interview, we talk about Dr. Paul's own approach, his objections to some rival approaches, and an objection to his. Dr. Paul, welcome back to the Trinity's Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dale. Dr. Paul, in your recent book, In Defense of Conciliar Christology, you interact with other recent work on this topic, and you give careful interpretations of and clear objections to many rival approaches. And this is one of the things I really appreciated about this book. You just put it right out there in numbered premises. Like, this is what I think you're saying. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is what I'm saying. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> and <laughs> I have to say, I really admire the approach. It's, it's very bold and manly. If somebody wants to disagree, it's like, okay, number four? Is that, is that what you, you know? <laughs> There's no putzing around. It's not like one can read a paragraph of it and say, well, I'm not sure what to make of that. It's, you're very clear and you stick your neck out every time you can. And uh, I appreciate that about the book. One much discussed strategy to try to construct a coherent but traditional Christology takes its inspiration from a statement in Philippians 2, where Paul says that Christ emptied himself. These theorists say that in order to become a man, Christ temporarily gave up, for instance, his divine omniscience, or at least the exercise of it. Dr. Paul, in your view, is this a good solution? Thanks for the question, Dale, and thanks for all those kind words, too, about my book. I really appreciate it, and it means a lot to me, especially coming from you. Concerning canonic Christology, the Christology of those who say that the verse you mentioned where Christ empties himself, the word for empty there is kenosis, if I understand it correctly in the Greek, it's called canonic Christology. Concerning that Christology, I think it's not going to be a universal answer to the objection that's being raised against conciliar Christology. Recall the objection looks something like this. Hey, look, anything that's God has to have this or that property or attribute or predicate apt of it. It's got to be impassable or immutable or omniscient or, you know, pick the rest. But hey, anything human has to have the complement or the opposite of that true of it. All humans are limited somehow in knowledge. All humans are changeable or mutable or passable. And nothing can be both passable and impassable or immutable and immutable, or all the rest. And so nothing can be both God and man. Now you conciliar Christologists say there is something that's God and man, and so much the worse for you. To my mind, there's lots of ways of responding to this. You might say, well, we don't really think he's one of those things. We don't really think he's omniscient, say. Or you might say, as the canonic thinkers do, well, we do think he is omniscient, and we do think he's limited in knowledge, but we don't think both at the same time. It's that denial of at the same time that gets them out of the pickle. Yeah, it's true that Tim sits and it's true that Tim stands, but he does them at different times. And so no big deal, no contradiction there. Like you might have a contradiction if Tim sits and stands at the same time. So the canonic theory, this emptying himself theory, says Christ has all these impressive divine attributes. He becomes incarnate, becomes one of us in flesh. He temporarily gives up these attributes, empties himself of them, and then later, maybe at the exaltation, takes them all back on. So he never at one point has both the property and its complement, or the predicate and its opposite apt of him at the same time. Now what do I say to that view? A couple things. One thing is this. On my reading of conciliar Christology, 
and I argue for this in the first chapter a bit and in the eighth chapter even more, conciliar Christology teaches that God is immutable. And they don't mean immutable in the way some understand it, like not fickle or true to his promises. They can't mean it that way because the way they use immutability is such that it's supposed to rule out ontological change on the part of the divine when the incarnation occurs. That is, they reference immutability to say how God doesn't go from being one way to another when he becomes incarnate. But of course, being not fickle or having high moral standards that you won't change are terrible reasons to think that something can't change when becoming incarnate. So they don't have that sort of weak immutability in mind. They have a much more robust sense of immutability in mind, at least on my reading of the texts. If that's the case, if they do have a very robust sense of divine immutability in play, it can't be the case that Jesus goes from being suitably impressive, like omnipotent, to being not impressive in that way and then changes back again. That is, the divine portion or element of the word isn't going to gain or lose anything, either in the incarnation or anywhere else, if this strong sense of immutability is true. So that's one reason. One reason I think the kenotic theory doesn't fit well with conciliar Christology. The second reason has to do with the things the texts say of Christ, even in his incarnate state. Now, if the canonic thinkers are right, then he's supposed to not be omnipotent, not be omnipresent, and not be ruling all of creation while he's emptied and on earth. He's given up those attributes. But in fact, when you look at the texts, you see them saying that he is still omnipotent. They say it's no failure of power on his part to become incarnate. They say that while a baby in swaddling cloths on the bosom of the virgin, he still filled all of creation and co-ruled it with the Father. And so here I think the conciliar texts themselves give us some good reasons for thinking he didn't give up some of these impressive attributes. But then if he didn't give up these attributes, the canonic approach isn't going to give us a response to all the allegedly inconsistent pairs of predicates the church says of Christ. It's just going to work for a couple better to have a response that works for all of them, including the ones like omnipresent and omnipotent. And finally, one third reason why I think the canonic theory is not going to be a, a good solution to this problem I mentioned earlier is that there's something called the doctrine of the exaltation, which I just mentioned earlier. And that doctrine says the following. It says that when Christ becomes resurrected, when he goes back to heaven and ascends in his glory, he's going to be exalted. He's going to get all his divine majesty. If he lost it, he's getting it all back. And if he didn't lose it, it's all going to be made manifest. If that's true, if Christ is exalted, then there's going to be a point in the future, maybe it's right now already, where he has all those divine attributes again after the exaltation. But if that's the case, if there's a point when he's incarnate and he has all those divine attributes, then kenosis isn't going to be a solution to this difficulty because the difficulty just rears its ugly head later in the incarnate life of Christ. It rears its head after the exaltation. For those three reasons, divine immutability, the things the councils themselves say about Christ's omnipresence and omnipotence, and the doctrine of the exaltation, I think canonic Christology is not going to be a good solution to this difficulty. Dr. Paul, another strategy in recent work is saying that the incarnate Christ has two minds. He already had a divine mind in eternity, and then when he, quote, assumes a complete human nature, he comes to have a human mind as well. What's your take on this strategy as a way to defend the coherence of incarnation? I think the claims of this strategy are consistent with, and in fact likely implied by, conciliar Christology. But I don't think this strategy is a good generalizable strategy for saving the doctrine of the incarnation from these philosophical objections. And here's why. I agree that Christ had two minds given conciliar Christology. I said in our previous podcast that as far as I know, 
Nowhere does it say explicitly that Christ has two minds in those early councils. It says he has two wills. It says he has two, they call them principles of action or energia, I think in the Greek, but it never says explicitly two intellects. But like I said there, the same arguments they give for two wills will work just as well, I think, for two minds. And so I think it's a good claim to make that Christ had two minds, good insofar as it's consistent with and likely implied by conciliar Christology. But I don't think that this claim alone is going to solve most of the philosophical objections raised against conciliar Christology. Perhaps it's useful for God's being omniscient. You can say he's omniscient because he has a mind such that that mind knows all things. That'd be the divine mind. And he's lacking omniscience or he has non-omniscience, however you might want to say it. He has that because he has a mind such that that mind doesn't know everything there is to know. That'll work there, but it doesn't work for things like immutability. Those two minds aren't going to help you say that he's mutable and immutable because just having a mind that's omniscient doesn't imply, as far as I can tell, immutability. And so as having two minds isn't going to capture or give you the predicates you need to say of Christ given conciliar Christology. So I think it's a good move, consistent with conciliar Christology, but it's not a sufficient move for answering this charge of incoherence or contradiction. It just doesn't go far enough. Doesn't go far enough, yep. One of the things that bothers people, I think, in recent times is that it would seem that God is essentially all-knowing, and yet Christ seems to act like a person who doesn't know things, and then one time he explicitly says he doesn't know the time of his future return. Mm -hmm. And so they think, well, maybe he has one mind in which there is complete knowledge and one mind in which there is limited knowledge. How would you treat that particular issue of omniscience? Yeah, I think that something counts as omniscient when it has a nature such that that nature knows all things. Or in virtue, better maybe to say, in virtue of that nature, he knows all things. And so I think you're lacking that quality when it's not the case that you have a nature that knows all things. Now, Christ doesn't lack that quality because he has a divine nature. But he's got a, a closely related quality, and that quality is having a nature that doesn't know some things. See, that's logically different than having no nature that knows all things. Mm -hmm. On my view, it's a lot like the two mind view insofar as I talk about natures, not minds, having a nature such that, having a mind such that. I talk about natures, but in the way I talk about natures, as we'll see in a bit, I think it's generalizable. So you can take the answer to the mind question make it about natures and generalize it to all sorts of other uh, apparent difficulties and apparently inconsistent predicates. So in a nutshell, in your view, during his ministry, Jesus is all-knowing and yet limited in knowledge, but properly understood, those are compatible. That's right, yeah. Well, let's talk about this more general strategy, Dr. Paul, that's in your book. You focus on what many people would think are incompatible predicates which conciliar Christology seems to demand are apt of one and the same Christ. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the pair mutable and immutable. Many hold that these really are incompatible, but urge that councils instruct us to say that Christ as divine is immutable, while Christ as human is mutable. The point being that these qualified statements really are coherent. Do you agree? Uh, no. <laughs> No, I don't think I do. I have a, uh, a soft spot in my heart for those sorts of modifications, and I think some of them might work too. Uh, I'll say a bit about that in a sec. But I think for the most part, those qua locutions, qua meaning uh, insofar as, I think those locutions aren't going to do as much work as people originally wanted them to do. It's true, the councils do say, that Christ suffered in the flesh or suffered qua his flesh or suffered in virtue of his flesh. And he was impassable in virtue of or according to his divine nature. So they certainly use those qua locutions. That's what I'll call them. I'll call them qua locutions insofar as modifiers you can append to these claims. They use them all right. And I think there's a good sense to be had for how they use them. But I don't think the sense to be had for how they use them is responding to this charge of incompatible predicates being true of Christ at the same time. 
here's how I see the dialectic going. I mentioned it a bit earlier when I talked about canonic Christology, but it goes like this. The objector says, hey, look, you've got these two properties or two predicates, take your pick. Immutable and mutable were ones that you used, Dale. You've got mutable and immutable, and they're both true of the same person. That can't be. You have a problem. And I said before, one response is, no, we don't say one of those of the person. We just say the other one. And that can't be because conciliar Christology does say both of the person. Next response, well, we say both, but not at the same time. And that was the canonic response. I gave some reasons for thinking that one wasn't consistent with conciliar Christology. A third response we're at now, well, we say both of those of the same person at the same time, but we don't say them in the same way. And the in the same way is supposed to be captured by these qua phrases. We say he's immutable in the divine way because he's immutable qua divine. And he's mutable in the human way because he's mutable qua human. So that's where the dialectic is. What to say about this? Well, these people are all presupposing these predicates are really incompatible with one another if said without the qualification. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's no reason to give the qualification. They're giving it to try to get around a difficulty if you're using qua claims to get around this objection. And so if we can show that these qua claims, a Christ is mutable qua human, if we can show that they imply the unmodified claim, just plain old Christ is mutable, then they've not done the work they're supposed to do because they're supposed to save us from contradiction. And here we have these claims that are modified implying, again, the old contradictory claims. So what they want, those who use qua locutions to get around this objection, what they want and need is some way to get the qua locutions to change the proposition in question so that it doesn't, in fact, become inconsistent or remain inconsistent with the other proposition. That's what they're doing. In the book, I spell out a bunch of different ways to do this. In fact, that chapter goes on maybe longer than it should, spelling out ways and ways and ways, and objections and objections and objections. Well, this is one of the ways in which your book, I think, really advances the discussion, because which term is being qualified? Subject, predicate, copula, the whole thing? Mm -hmm. You're, to a greater degree than anyone I've seen, parsing out all these options, and do they do the work that's needed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Dale. The ways you just mentioned of modifying, I'll, I'll say a bit about those now. So you have a phrase like, Christ is mutable, qua human. And that phrase is composed of a three-word sentence, Christ is mutable. And then this new appended modifier. And the question is, what does the modifier do in the sentence? Does the modifier modify the whole sentence? Like take the phrase, Tim is sitting. That's right now false because I'm standing. But it's possibly true. Possibly, Tim is sitting is true. There we're taking the word possibly and we're modifying the whole sentence. We're not saying there's a new subject, possibly Tim, and possibly Tim does something, namely sit. We're not saying possibly modifies a predicate. There's something I'm doing right now and it's called possibly sitting. We're saying that whole claim, Tim is sitting, is something that is possibly true. So the modifier can modify the whole claim or it can modify any of those individual bits or pieces of the claim. To retool an old example, think of the claim, Tim is red qua his lips, or Tim is red because of his lips. There's a couple different ways you can understand that. Maybe I'm saying there's something, namely Tim's lips, and those lips are red. There I've taken the modifier and I've made it modify the subject. We're not talking about Tim and saying Tim is red. We're changing the subject, Tim's lips. Tim's lips are the red things. Or maybe it goes the other way. Maybe we're sticking with Tim as a subject. Tim is, and then here we have to change the predicate to make the predicate modify with the word red. Maybe red-lipped. Tim is red-lipped. In the first case, Tim's lips are red. We're predicating of just a part of me. In this case, we're predicating of the whole Tim. All of Tim is such that it's red-lipped. So those are three different ways. Modify the whole assertion, modify just the subject, Tim's lips, modify just the predicate, red-lipped, and finally, a kind of strange one, you modify the copula, you modify the is in the sentence. Tim is lippedly 
red. <laughs> something <laughs> along those lines. <laughs> I didn't think through that part before I spoke it. It needs to be something like that. Or in Christ's case, it's easier to see. Christ is humanly mutable. Christ is divinely immutable. And so what I do in the book is I draw these four different ways of modifying the statement. And then I subdivide some of them further. And then I ask, well, are there objections to these? What would the objections be? What sorts of responses can you give to the objections? And in the end, I argue that modifying the whole assertion, where the assertion is Christ is mutable, and adding the modifier as a human to it, that's not going to work because that doesn't insulate from the entailment of the original claim, is what I say. You take Christ is mutable qua human, you understand the modifier is modifying the whole assertion, and you can show that it entails the truth of the original claim, which is what we didn't want it to do. Just that he's mutable. And if you do it the other way for immutable, then it's just going to turn out one and the same Christ is mutable and immutable. That's right. That's what we didn't want to say in the first place. Yep, that's right. I say that it's not going to work for the modifying of the subject view either. There you'd say, when you say Christ is mutable qua human, what you're saying is Christ's human component, Christ's human nature is mutable. And you'd say, well, what does it mean then to say Christ is immutable qua divine? His divine component, his divine nature is immutable. And there, that's just not going to work for the conciliar texts because the conciliar texts explicitly say that one and the same Christ is both. Here's a passage I, I read for the last podcast from the Seventh Council, the Second Council of Nicaea. Actually, as I said there, it's from the Eighth Council, but they're quoting the Seventh Council. So here's how it goes. It says, We also know that the Seventh Holy and Universal Synod, held for a second time at Nicaea, taught correctly when it professed, that one and the same Christ, as both visible and invisible Lord, incomprehensible and comprehensible, unlimited and limited, incapable and capable of suffering, inexpressible and expressible in writing. There, it's one and the same thing, which is being predicated by these apparently contradictory predicates. And so it just can't be the case that we use the subject modification view, where you take the qua modifier and you put it on the subject. Because we still have to be able to say at the end of the day that one and the same thing, this particular person, Christ, is incapable and capable of suffering. And if you put the qua modifier on the subject so that it's just his human nature that's changeable or able to suffer, his divine nature that's unchangeable or unable to suffer, then you don't get one and the same thing, just the one guy being both, which is what the councils say you have to say. Finally, the last two, the, the predicate modifying, where you say things like he is red-lipped, and the copula modifying, where you say things like he is humanly mutable. Those, I think there's a way of understanding them where you can, in fact, get around this objection, but I think they have some costs associated with them that aren't associated with my preferred strategy. Briefly, the costs turn out to be like this. Understanding what it is for a copula to be modified and the way it needs to be for this to work it's kind of tricky. You, you saw me flounder unintentionally on red-lipped or um, is red-lippedly. A, it's a hard thing to understand. Another problem with that copula approach is that our current first order logic doesn't have a means by which to show adverbial modification of the copula. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not going to fit well with our current logic. Mm -hmm. For the predicate view, for the changing of the predicates, that I think works better because there you are predicating of the very same person in both cases. That text I read said one in the same Christ is invisible and visible Lord. Well, here you're saying one in the same thing is, and here's the predicate, I suppose, humanly visible or H visible, which is a predicate and it means visible in a human sort of way. That's a way of doing it. But I don't know how well it's going to work, and here's why. Suppose, for argument's sake, that multiple incarnations are possible. I've written a bit about this, about multiple incarnations. Suppose that one person, one divine person, can become incarnate in two natures. I think, so far as I can tell, that's possible. I don't argue for that in this book, but suppose it's possible. And then you'd have, say, Christ becomes incarnate in two human natures, and one's asleep and laying down, 
and one is, say, doing jumping jacks. There you can say of Christ that he has one bodily shape, lay, uh, laying down shape. I guess that's flat, we can call it. And he has another bodily shape, whatever shape you have when you're doing jumping jacks. And the question here is, are those incompatible traits? And I think the answer here is going to be, yeah. We think in regular human cases, like I mentioned earlier, sitting and standing are incompatible predicates. Both can't be apt of me at the same time. But likewise, laying down and doing jumping jacks are incompatible. This qua approach says, aha, here's how you solve those incompatibilities. You modify the predicate so that you name the nature in it. So you have to say, he's humanly laying down or he's H laying down. But here is a problem. If he's got two human natures, then the modifying of the predicates isn't going to do the work it's supposed to do. And that's because if those predicates are really incompatible and the only way to resolve them is to modify to a nature type, and you're modifying to the same nature type in both cases, humanly sleeping, humanly awake, humanly lying down, humanly doing jumping jacks, you're not going to resolve the difficulties. So to conclude that argument, if multiple incarnations are possible, the predicate modification view has an additional hurdle or problem with it that it has to find a way to solve to be viable. But wouldn't you just be modifying relative to two different human natures? So... In other words, he would be standing insofar as he has this human nature and he would be also lying insofar as he has this second human nature? Mm hmm So it depends what you're modifying to. And I think that's what you're pointing out here. And the modifier is with respect to this particular nature, like this thing right here I can kick. Mm -hmm. And the other one is laying down with respect to this particular nature, this nature over here that's sleeping. So let's be quiet. If that's what's going on, then there's a problem. And the problem is this. We thought that we could say the same predicate of two different things. We thought before that we could say that I'm sitting and you're standing or vice versa. But if all of our predicates are really modified to a nature and not just a nature type, like a general type, like human or animal or created thing, but are modified all the way to the base level to this particular nature, mm -hmm then it's not going to be the case that one and the same predicate is apt of me and apt of you. Mm. How could it be? You have one nature, I have mine, and natures are always smuggled into predicates. And I, I take that to be a problem that we can't say the same predicate of two different things. Like, say, members of a species. We couldn't say you and I are both human and use human univocally right. because human means one thing for you and one thing for me. Right. Yeah, that's not how those type of terms work. Yeah. So to sum up the whole discussion of the qua move, which is in your chapter six, it's not that you have a problem with saying those things, but you don't think that they do the work that's required, at least in most cases. And so that language doesn't play any essential role in your own solution. That's right. I view the qua locutions, I view them as ontological laser pointers, so to speak. What the qua does is just points to that in reality in virtue of which the predicate is apt of the subject. So when I say Christ is immutable qua divine, what I take myself to be saying is Christ is immutable. That's true. What is it in reality in virtue of which he's immutable? Well, one important and integral part of making that claim or that predicate apt of Christ is, and now I turn on my ontological laser pointer, I say qua, is that nature right there, that divine nature. So I think all it does is just stand to point out, uh, you might say a truth maker or an essential part of a truth condition for the predicate being predicated of the subject. Right, and that's an uncontroversial way to understand those that type of language. Yeah, yeah and I think that's a benefit. They weren't doing these really fancy qualocution moves, I think, in these councils. They were trying to tell you why it's true to say he's immutable because he's got that divine thing. And why is it true to say that he bled? Because he's got that human thing. And the way they did that was they said, according to his divine nature, 
Dr. Paul, let's discuss your own solution to this problem of apparently incompatible predicates being applied to one and the same Christ. So, for instance, mutable and immutable. You argue, at first glance, surprisingly, that these predicates, mutable and immutable, are compatible after all, that they can both be apt of the same thing at the same time and in the same way. Help us to understand your reasoning here. Mm -hmm. I agree that at first glance it's surprising to say that sort of thing. Well, I felt conciliar Christology pulled in that direction just because of that text I read to you earlier from Second Nicaea and other similar texts where they say quite explicitly that he's got both what appear to be incompatible predicates. And I thought to myself, these are groups of hundreds and hundreds of, some very learned, some not so learned, bishops coming together to make sense of what they have to say. And it's not that they were all keen on giving contradictions. In fact, many of them were keen on refuting their opponents by means of showing their opponents had contradictory views. That's how Athanasius argued against Arius. He, he'd say things, whether you got it right or not, I don't know, I can't tell, but he'd say things like, Arius, if you're right about thus and such, then this is the right reading of scripture, but it's not the right reading of scripture, and so you're wrong about thus and such. That's just arguing to a contradiction. This reading of scripture can't be both true and false, and your view means it has to be true, but that can't be right, so your view is false. My point here is that these people had made an industry of arguing to contradiction, and when they thought they got to contradiction, they thought they had shown their opponents' views to be false. So it just seems to me wildly implausible that they would let this contradiction lie in their own theory, and not lie hidden behind some nook or cranny, but explicitly asserted boldly in their minutes of their meetings, in their definitions of faith, in their statements. It's just too much. So I thought to myself, when they say things like he's both mutable and immutable, one and the same Christ, what could they be doing here? And I thought, well, they could be doing something canonic, but that's not going to work. They could be saying that he's got these fancy qua moves going on, but I think there's grave reservations there. What if we understand these predicates in ways that aren't flatly contradictory in a very specific setting? And here's how I thought to do it. Think of it like this. I have an analogy I give. I don't know if it's any good, but I'll do it anyway. I like it. Uh, suppose I'm standing, and I'll do it right now in my office, with one arm straight out from my shoulder and one arm hooked upwards at my elbow. So if you look at me like an airplane, both arms out, I take my right arm and I face my fingers upwards toward the ceiling. If I stand like that, my arms are in different sorts of positions, and we'd naturally call one arm bent that is the one with the fingers facing the ceiling, my right arm, and the other arm straight, that is the one that just sticks out straight from my shoulder toward the other wall. Now let's just make up some predicates. Consider the predicate arm unbent. When is something arm unbent? Well, it's my predicate and I get to make it up, so I'm going to tell you. Something is arm unbent when it's got an arm that's not bent at more than 90 degrees. I think that's how I want to say it. When it's got an arm that's straight, in other words. And when is something arm bent? Well, let me just stipulate it's arm bent when it's got an arm that's bent at more than 90 degrees or at or more than 90 degrees. So my fingers facing the ceiling are an instance of being, of a something being arm bent. Now here I am fulfilling both truth conditions, truth condition for arm unbent, truth condition for arm bent. And I'm fulfilling them because I have two different arms. They can be two different ways. And in virtue of how those arms are, the truth conditions for these claims can be met. I think the same is true for Christology in the following sense. Suppose you start by saying something is immutable when it, it can't change. That's the truth conditions, it can't change. And it's mutable when it can change. That's the truth conditions for mutability. Mm -hmm. Well, here, nobody in the world would ever want to say that one and the same thing is mutable and immutable if that's what it means to be mutable and immutable. They wouldn't have said that at the councils. They wouldn't have ratified it at latter councils. It just seems like a non-starter. It can't be what these guys meant to be saying. What if we change it, though? What if we say something is mutable when it has a nature that can change or be changed? And what if we say something is immutable when it has a nature that can't be changed? So what I'm doing is I'm taking has a nature such that, and I'm putting that at the beginning of these predicates. If you do that, 
then just like me with two arms, I have two arms that can fulfill the conditions for different predicates being true of me. Christ has two natures. They can fulfill the conditions for different predicates being true of him. And now we can see why that was so important for the fathers to use these qua locutions. They use the qua locutions just to show you which nature it was in virtue of which the predicate was after the subject. That's the way I view it anyway. Dr. Paul, as you discuss towards the end of your book, some who have heard your interpretation of conciliar Christology have objected that they detect an odor of Nestorianism in it. And I'm interested in what your response is to that. And I was wondering if you could read us a few pages of your book where you get up on your soapbox and complain about this type of objection. I'd like to hear that and also how you answer this Nestorianism charge or the odor charge. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Got maybe just under three paragraphs that I could read about that. It goes like this. Too often I hear allegations of a person's view, quote, hinting of Nestorianism, or, quote, having a whiff of Nestorianism, or as being a low-grade Nestorianism, or being Nestorianism light, or Nestorianism like. It is not just Nestorianism that gets this treatment. There are also grades, degrees, hints, gestures toward and faint odors of, docetism, Arianism, and all the rest as well. It seems to me that such hedging on the accusation of heresy is often coupled with a lack of concern for giving good evidence for the accusation. And here they might say, I'm not saying it is full-fledged, unapologetic heresy after all, just minor, trifling, low-calorie heresy, hardly worth the time of demonstrating, but definitely worth the time of stating perhaps while raising my eyebrow conspiratorially. From the perspective of a person ecclesiastically bound to affirm the denial of these heresies, that is, Catholics, the Orthodox, and some confessional Protestants, such claims can be wounding. To understand the gravity of such an allegation, replace the word Nestorianism with the word adultery in the quotations, and ask yourself whether it would be permissible to accuse, without explicit justification, a person's actions of, quote, hinting at adultery, or being low-grade adultery, or light adultery. Just as a charge of adultery, even light or low-grade adultery, is a charge that one has broken a serious and sacred obligation to another, the charge of heresy, even light or low-grade heresy is, at least to the Catholic or Orthodox Christian, a charge that one has broken a serious and sacred obligation to another. As such, hedging the claim does nothing to decrease the wound of the charge, and often serves to remove the accuser's felt need to justify the accusation. So my friendly suggestion, if you are going to charge someone as a heretic, you ought to take the time to show it. And if you can't show it, it is better not to say it at all. And two further suggestions, since I find I'm still perched atop my soapbox. First, if you decide to make the charge, do it in charity. No need to din it into the ears of the opponent, as the church fathers were sometimes wont to do. And second, be prepared to answer questions of the following sort. What exactly is the measure of heresy and orthodoxy? If your answer amounts to the claim that the preponderance of men in tall hats at a particular gathering over a millennium ago said so, it would serve you well to have an answer to the question, why that gathering, and not the gatherings of other Christians point to. If your answer amounts to the claim that the pages in this collection of disparate books written over many centuries and bound together at a much later date say so, one wouldn't be wasting one's time preparing an answer to the question, why that collection of texts and not the collections of the other Christians point to. So that's that part of the text. It does kind of get under my skin when people will make a charge of uh, heresy or a charge of being at the wrong with respect to your church, if you're a member of an ecclesial body that has these strong sort of claims like I am as a Roman Catholic, it does get under my skin when people do that and also don't justify the claim they're making. And if they do it in such a way that's um, 
that could be it could be a company with a smug chortle instead of a reason or with a rhetorical flourish instead of a reason it doesn't help much as far as i can tell so to this charge in particular the charge of nestorianism what might i say in response to what you asked well the following the things i say of christ's human nature in the book are quotations from the councils when the councils say it is the thing that bled was pierced and thought and wept well i say it too and if it follows from this that i'm an historian then it follows that leo the great was an historian and it follows that cyril of alexandria the guy who led the charge against nestorius was also an historian and not a hiding historian but an historian in the very letters he used to condemn Nestorius for being Nestorian and the letters that were employed at the council for refuting Nestorius for being a Nestorian. And so I guess my view is if your view of Nestorianism implies that Cyril of Alexandria was a Nestorian, then you've got the wrong view of Nestorianism. Part of the problem I think here is that there's a tradition in Christian theological thinking of just using heresy terminology or heresy labels as a kind of substitute for thinking things through properly. Mm -hmm. And especially from a Roman Catholic point of view, it's a really serious charge to be an historian. You compared it to adultery, it's also like in a way uh, treason or something. Yeah, yeah it um, is. That's a quasi-legal term if you're actually believing or propounding a, an official heresy. But I wonder, a person who, who says these kind of irritating things, I wonder if their mistake is using that term <laughs> <laughs> rather than describing what their problem is. What if they rephrased and said, no, I'm not saying it's a heresy. It's just that you have these two things in the man Christ, and they both seem like selves. And it seems like you've got too many of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a much better way of putting the charge, I think. And I think it's a, that's a good sort of charge to deal with. And it's a sort of charge I try to deal with in the book as well. I like that it's not put in terms of heresy for one reason, because as you noted and I noted, it, it could be wounding to charge somebody with heresy. But also because so often the measure for heresy just isn't provided by people. So I know as a Roman Catholic what I can point to to find the measure of heresy and orthodoxy. I point to the councils and the ex cathedra statements of the popes and maybe some other things. But I don't know what I could point to when talking with some groups of people who aren't ecclesially bound the way I am. Do I point to the first four councils and that's all that's the measure of orthodoxy? If so, why those councils? And which parts of the councils? Sometimes they say the creed of Chalcedon I don't even think Chalcedon had a creed. It had a definition of faith. So I'm not quite sure how seriously to take the charge of heresy from somebody if that person doesn't know the measure of heresy that he or she is using, why that measure is a good measure of heresy, and what the texts of the documents actually say. In the standard translation we have now from Tanner, it's about 140 pages for the first seven councils. And those pages are facing page translations. So on the left side, you have Greek and Latin. On the right side, you have English, which means that you have only about half pages because there, it's only about half a page of text to be translated. So about, what, 75 pages, full pages of text to read to get through all seven ecumenical councils. It behooves us, I think, if we're going to talk about heresy and orthodoxy, to at least read these councils, figure out what they say and why they say it. Amen to that. Dr. Paul, thanks so much for talking with us. Yeah, thank you for having me, Dale. It's a great pleasure. This week's thinking music has been Music Sweet Home, Rock Instrumental by Ivan Chu, if that is his real name. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can listen to or download the entire track. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share the podcast on social media. Help us to get the word out on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and so on. Another thing you can do is give us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. For some directions on how to do this, just go to trinities.org slash blog slash review. 
you can support the podcast by giving us a one-time or a monthly donation through PayPal. Just look for the orange buttons on the right side of any blog post. Every little bit helps. And if you shop at Amazon.com, enter that website through a blog post. If you do this and then make a purchase, then without increasing your price, we get a small percentage. Lastly, make your voice heard. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode. Or join our very active Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. We're always open to show ideas, guest suggestions, objections, and so on. Sometimes I even respond to feedback in an episode. Don't forget then to share, to rate, to chip in when you can, and to talk back. for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.